Um, so I'm going to give a very quick update on SwarmKit. Uh, last time we talked was back in Berlin in the Distributed System Summit. So it's been about six months since then. So I'm going to uh, give a brief recap of what happened during the past six months, the changes we made in SwarmKit, and then uh, do like a quick presentation of like the new stuff we've been currently working on. So um, not going to spend too much time uh, going to the details. There was a, a talk uh, on Tuesday by Drew and Nishant that explained all those features and details. But um, to sum up, in the latest release, we added HA uh, scheduling. So HA scheduling uh, allows you to spread containers uh, of a service on different machines. It, guarantees that we're going to try our very best not to create single point of failure. So we're going to uh, distribute containers from the same service on different machines if possible, like if there are enough machines. Uh, we've been working on topology-aware scheduling. So um, topology-aware scheduling allows you to spread containers over different racks, um, AZs, and so on. So if you have multiple data centers, the scheduler will try to load balance those containers between uh, those data centers. So if you have, a, let's say, a service with four replicas and you have two data centers, SwarmKit will try to place uh, two containers on each DC. So we also made uh, quite a few improvements on um, the security side of things. So we have, um, now we do encryption at rest for the RAF store. So all your content like uh, services, secrets, and so on are going to be stored uh, encrypted. We also um, do like a, a encryption key encryption so that your encryption key is encrypted as well. There's a secrets management, <coughs> um, which was presented during the, uh, the keynote. We have a health aware of orchestration. So, um, it's a way to basically make sure that you have uh, zero downtime deployment. So when we are bringing down like a, a container because we need to update it, first we're gonna remove it from the load balancer, then we're gonna, uh, once it's removed from the load balancer, we're gonna shut it down. Um, a bunch of improvements on rollbacks. So now we have automatic rollback. You can define like uh, what's the behavior, what's the threshold to, to kick off a rollback. We have, uh, uh, we have service logs, so you can just um, grab logs of a service, so it will aggregate uh, all the containers that are part of the service and basically give that back to, to the CLI. So what's next? Um, one of the biggest thing we're currently working on is container deintegration. So right now, uh, you can use SwarmKit in two ways. Either you use it uh, through Docker, or you can use it standalone. If you use SwarmKit in a standalone mode, we have something called an executor, so it's a swappable backend. The, the one uh, we ship in standalone mode basically talks to the Docker API, so the, the, the REST API, and basically whenever we need to schedule a container, it runs a Docker run. Um, what we're trying to do is to have an executor for uh, container D, so that you, you will be able to like orchestrate and run Docker containers without Docker at all, so it's gonna be straight from uh, Swarm Control to the Swarm Kit and back to Container D. There's already a, a PR out. We're still sketch, sketching out the details, figure out like how we're gonna do networking, uh, lib network integration, and so on and so forth. Um, we have, uh, we're working also on config management. So it's very similar to secrets, except that you can attach the configuration to any uh, location of the container. The, the use case is for, for example, today when you want to have, um, let's say, an Nginx with a custom configuration, the only way to do that is to build a custom image. So you do like from Nginx, then you attach some static configuration, you do a build, push, and so on. With config management, now you can just create a config object, and then you can run like a vanilla Nginx, and you can just say, I want to map this nginx config to etsy nginx and it will do that uh, for you so we provide the same guarantees that we have for secrets so there's going to be um, rolling updates automatic rollback health checks and so on with uh, config management um, we also uh, are working on events so 
Today, Docker Events only gives you uh, events regarding uh, containers, images, and so on. With Swarm Events, you're going to be able to see events regarding services, uh, nodes, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's provided to a, a new like gRPC Watch API, and we also integrated that into the Docker Remote API. So it's uh, it's almost ready to go. It's probably going to be there by um, sometime by mid-May, probably. Um, we also spent quite a lot of time on working on a new thing we're calling a generic runtime. The, the idea is that today SwarmKit can run containers, but that actually is abstracted behind the task model and interface. We, we're we're going to uh, ship something we call a generic runtime. It's a way to run, uh, basically orchestrate other things than containers and uh, without baking that code into SwarmKit. So you can just, uh, you can basically define a new type and then say I want to have like 10 replicas of that and then you're going to define a custom executor that will say like how you're going to run that. As an example, uh, the first use case is plugins. Today, um, so we're working on plugin support in Swarm for Docker. Um, the idea is that we have that working and it's not a single line of plugins going into SwarmKit. And uh, in the future, we can use that to schedule uh, unikernels or any kind of task, one-off task, and, and so on. Like if we want to, uh, let's say that if we want to do like a Docker system DF to gather uh, like disk information, stuff like that, of the entire cluster, Docker could just schedule a global service uh, with a custom executor that basically gathers that, that information back. Finally, uh, we're also working on uh, instrumentation. So that's very, like, it's, it's really crucial for uh, moving to, to production. For the time being, we, we started to, uh, so SwarmKit heavily relies on gRPC, so we added um, uh, basically an interceptor for gRPC traffic, and we're able to, uh, to basically get a, gr a breakdown of um, like uh, RPC rate, latencies, and so on. Um, so you can see, uh, for instance, the heartbeat rate of, of the cluster. We're also working on adding uh, custom metrics such as uh, nodes by state. So you can see like how many nodes are in the cluster, how many are down, what's the, what's the rate of uh, new nodes joining, and that's pretty much it. I'm gonna let Madhu continue on, on networking. Thank you. Um, uh, during Berlin, we, had, we discussed about the 112 features that we implemented. Uh, so we had the 1703 and 1704 releases after that. So the main, uh, we were very concentrating on uh, stability of the routing mesh in 1703, which got much better. Uh, and we introduced the network plugins in Swarm mode, which started working in 1703. And most importantly, we had the Windows feature priority. In 1703, we got, um, uh, most of the swarm mode functionality that was missing in Windows, we got we added there. And now overlay devices also works in Windows, and so now we can have a swarm mode uh, service uh, network with Windows services and Linux services running on the same overlay network. So that's one of the features that we added in 1703. With Windows have a reasonable parity with Linux on overlay driver, service discovery, and so on and so forth. And for those who are not part of the, the previous summit, I have listed all the features that we added from 1.7 till 1.12 in this slide, so you can take a look at that. And if you have any questions, we can, we can work on all the features in the, uh, the post-lunch session. Okay, so now, what's next for us? Um, so it's pretty straightforward. We are gonna do, we're gonna concentrate on quality first. Uh, networking troubleshooting has been a challenge for most of the, those who are not part of the who cannot delve deeper into networking aspects. So we're adding a lot of visibility, monitoring, and troubleshooting tools in the Docker project, in the uh, Limiter project, to make sure one can troubleshoot uh, any issues easily. And we have some scale issues with, uh, uh, with uh, load balancer specifically, especially the IPvS configurations. So we are working to fix those issues in the short term. From feature standpoint, uh, we have a lot of requests on network policies. Uh, so we are trying to see if we can work with the CNCF team to see if we can, how we can reuse the network policies that being used in the Kubernetes team project 
and see how you can apply it in the Docker networking as well. Uh, one other request that we have seen a lot is the, the swarm mode support for local scope plugins. So today, uh, swarm mode supports only the global scope plugins, like the overlay network driver or the Weave plugin and so on and so forth, while uh, there are lots of uh, requests to support Mac VLAN and IP VLAN with uh, swarm mode. Uh, so we are concentrating on that. We are hoping to get it in for 1706, fingers crossed. Uh, and more important for Mobi Summit, we are concentrating on componentization. So we want to make sure we integrate cleanly with container D. And uh, we are trying to see how we can make the CNA interface work well with the lib, lib network as well, right? So in order to show what I'm talking about here, I'm going to switch to my shell and see if we can, uh, uh, I'll show some code. It's not a demo, just a, ah, uh, it's too small. It's okay? Hopefully, yes. All right. All right, so what I want to show you here is, um, so Lib Network is already pretty uh, well isolated as a, as a component, just that we didn't spend time in actually showing it as a component, like the way uh, Justin was explaining before. I think we can do a better job there. Uh, but to showcase how it is already componentized, how it's already integrated pretty cleanly with continuity, I'm gonna showcase the, the code that, that we implemented in Docker 1.10 is being in Docker from 110 onwards, which nobody has explored so far. So I want to show you here how it is integrating with Docker today. So when the, when the container is, when you do a container start, I'm going to further. So you see that there are two functions here, the initialize networking and create spec. So initialize networking is the one where the CNM concept comes in. It's the model. It's a, CNM is the container network model where the network management pieces are integrated with the container requirements, right? Like, like IP address assignments, so on and so forth. It's, this is taken care of in the initial networking. But the create spec is the one where daemon actually creates a spec with the help of container D here. So here we create the container D spec and we pass along to the subsequent components. If you look in the create spec of the container D integration, you see here that um, we actually depend on the namespace created by continuity, and it's the callback hook of continuity it's what, which actually invokes the lib network back. So actually there's no, we don't depend on the lib network, the Docker direct call to lib network to actually program the containers. It's actually continuity's hook, which is already in place, which we are making use of today to program the lib network, right? So the idea that we have right now is that, hey, Continuity hook is exactly what CNI is using, right, for the low-level uh, integration. So we can actually try to see if we can uh, use CNI as uh, this layer to use Lib Network and CNI to program the low-level uh, interfaces to the drivers while still use CNM for the network management piece. Since CNM is the model, while CNI is the interface, we can actually have both working simultaneously at the same time and provide the guarantees of CNM where it provides the uh, required portability requirement for their services across the drivers, while use the CNI interface for actually programming the drivers itself, right? This is the idea that we have, and if you look at the lib network uh, portions of this one, so in lib network, there's a file called sandbox external key. So what happens is whenever this uh, callback comes from the uh, container D, we have to do a re-exec, and the re-exec actually calls the uh, process uh, set ex uh, set re exec and here we do actual, this is where actually we do the, the programming really. This is where the, the actual uh, uh, driver API actually being called. So for those who are not aware of the driver APIs, the driver API here in Docker, this is the equivalent of CNI. So if you look at the CNI, it's the low level interface which Live Network has towards the plugins. This is what the CNI can actually replace. Right, but the rest of the network can exist from the CNM standpoint, from, from network management and uh, resource allocation and so on and so forth. 
Also, we have this tool called DNet to make sure that we, Liberator can be an independent component and can be independent on its own. And DNet is there forever, and we use this DNet for all the integration CLI that we have in Docker. So the limit network itself is pretty componentized already, uh, but with uh, the SwarmKit integration, we had some assumptions in place, which once we kind of decouple that, limit network can be a component, can be used the way Mobi uh, stack was being explained before. So pretty much that's it I have to offer today. And uh, if you have any questions, we can talk after the lunch session. Yep, thanks. Nathan? Nathan? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? They want to. All right, there you go. Yeah, guys, coffee is coming. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> no, no, you can get started, but we offered coffee and it's not there yet. All right, I don't have any slides, which I hope is a good thing because you've probably all seen plenty of slides. Um, so I'm just gonna give a very, very, very brief update on the Notary project, which is our signing infrastructure. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, it's kind of a very quiet back piece of uh, Docker Content Trust. Um, so it backs everything we do with signing images, and as you might have seen if you got to go to Nathan, sorry, Nathan, uh, Diogo and Riaz's talk, uh, we're also finding a lot of applications for it in the uh, Linux Kit project, uh, InfraKit, and other parts of getting secure infrastructure. So uh, we're gonna have a birds of a feather this afternoon, so I'd really like people to come along, give us your use cases, because we would love to find out how to make it really easy for you to use Notary. Um, but some highlights from the last year, we added our first two maintainers from outside the Docker organization. Uh, we added Huka Ping from Huawei and Evan Cordell from CoreOS. Um, we got Notary integrated into uh, some of our enterprise products, and we're seeing people find uses for it, but we really want to work on usability for the next year. That's gonna be our big focus. Um, additionally, we have a, a highlight. Uh, there are PRs open at the moment. We would like people to go and look at them. One of the things we discovered was that Docker does a end-to-end -end integrity verification when doing an initial download and run of a container. It takes a notary, it takes a signature from notary, from that gets a mapping from a tag to a checksum. The checksum is of a manifest. Docker goes and downloads the manifest, uses the checksum to verify it. Within that manifest, we have checksums of layer TARs. We go and download the layers, verify the checksums of those TARs. But once they're unpacked, we no longer have any integrity verification. Now, if you've just downloaded it, this is probably okay, you've literally just unpacked it. But if you have something in your image cache, locally on your host, somebody can modify that today, and you will run an image with whatever that person has put inside it. So one of the things we've uh, worked on um, from the notary team is adding a full end-to-end -end verification, where we actually now have an integrity checksum of the unpacked layers on disk as composed into the structure your image or your container expects to see them when it runs. We have PRs open for this. Um, I am happy to talk to everybody about this if they wanna come by the birds of a feather later and explain how it works. Um, but people, please look at those. We think it's a really good improvement uh, to Docker as far as security goes. Uh, I don't think I have any other major updates for Notary, but I would love to see everyone come by later. Who's next? That's above my pay grade. <laughs> oh, sorry, the question was whether Moby's gonna, or Notary is gonna move into the Moby project or stay under Docker, and I think other people are making that decision at the moment. <laughs> Somebody got a list of action items somewhere? Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, who is it? 
Hi, um, David Chung here. Um, I'm here to give a brief update on the on this project called Infricate. Um, uh, some of you might, I'm sure you've, you've heard of it being talked about. Uh, uh, it's a pretty new project, and um, so just to kind of give it a, a brief background, we're uh, first launched in uh, LinuxCon um, in Berlin back in uh, last October. So uh, it's been about six months. Uh, it's a very new project. We launched it out in the open, uh, try to design, implement it in the open in order to involve the community and, and to really solicit ideas. Uh, the idea here really is to build a toolkit for building declarative and self-managing distributed applications. Um, but how do we, you know, so we want to tackle the problems of provisioning of resources um, in addition to really some of the harder problems of uh, how do you actively manage and, um, this, this type of resources and, you know, by providing functionalities like um, scaling groups, you know, rolling updates, um, being able to do uh, active monitoring, health checks, and, and you know, connect nodes to you know, L4, um, you know, load balancers as they come up. So there's a lot of active control elements that's within the, um, within the infrared sort of the uh, tool chain. Um, so now we could go into that in a little more detail. And there's also um, part of this is sort of the declarative infrastructure. So you can think of it as sort of a, a cross-platform way of doing um, cloud formation. So uh, it's, a, it's a way for you to describe what your infrastructure should look like. Um, and the system actually works hard to ensure that it converges to your specifications. So this is a brief architecture. Um, you can find it on GitHub. Um, the usual, you know, pets and cattle uh, managing the type of uh, clusters as the servers. We also have CLI, and uh, we're working on providing an API um, endpoints so that people can start building applications uh, to treat it as, you know, your own auto scaling group um, running on any kind of hardware platform. So where does it fit? Um, conceptually, the easiest way to just think about is to think in terms of the CLI. So if you um, if you think about Docker um, and, and kubectl, that's, you know, we, we kind of typically call it sort of the container orchestration, and really InfraKit is focusing at the infrastructure side. So a, a pretty good analogy of that is, is depending on the different public clouds that you're using, you may be used to the G Cloud API, the CLI, or the AWS CLI, or the Azure. But in every different platform, you're kind of doing sort of the, um, using their, you know, their t terminology, doing different things. And what Infrica is trying to do is provide a common um, way for you to interact with that type, you know, uh, a set of common abstractions, such as auto scaling groups and um, uh, in the future, uh, spot instance fleets for whatnot. So you can, there's a consistent way to interact with the infrastructure layer. And ideally, this is sort of what, the, the, this is what we're trying to achieve. Is, is that so at the higher level, in terms of container orchestration, the users can pick the best tool, whether it's Docker or Kubernetes. Um, but really, at the infrastructure orchestration level, Inf InfraKit will be responsible for bringing in the infrastructure that made it available for the container orchestration layer. And we'll be the go-between and be able to interface southbound with the actual fabric. So for, for example, interview, you know, um, interfacing with RackHD, uh, one view mass for you know actual hardware operations to cluster operation using KVM um, VMware or to cloud operations in you know um, in, in terms of actually running workloads on uh, AWS Azure or GCP. So this is kind of how we see ourselves in terms of where Infrakit would fit. So what's the current status? Well, considering for a project that was launched six months ago. Um, we really didn't really have any kind of expectations other than just really getting our heads down to kind of build out the features and, and put the systems together. And then, and then we saw this on the showroom floor, you know, on the exhibit hall um, this week. Um, we, have, we had a big shout out to you know, our partners over at HP and um, you know, Dell EMC. Um, we're, we're actually seeing people talking about InfraKit plugins that are integrating InfraKit with um, EMC hardware, with, you know, with HP hardware. Um, so it's actually really quite encouraging, considering that it's a, it's a project that was kind of launched quietly um, six months ago, but now we're starting to see people actually doing things with it. So um, it, it's, it's really great. Uh, big shout out to everybody, everybody who's been contributing to that. 
so, so one of the things obviously would make it useful is that if, if, if we can support more platforms. So at, this, at the current moment, we actually are getting a lot of support from the bare metal side. So we have integration with HP OneView. Uh, we have MOS plugin, so uh, Ubuntu um, Metal as Service. Rack HD, uh, the public cloud, we have, um, you know, we have drivers for uh, AWS GCP. Um, on the hypervisor side, we have HyperKit that's running on Mac OS X, thanks to the Cambridge team and the Linux Kit te um, team. So, and we also have Docker container integration that's coming, that, that's coming from the community. And what we'll have coming soon will be Azure, IBM, DigitalOcean, Packet, and, and direct libvirt integration. Um, and we're also looking, and currently we also have support for like resource types that are other than um, compute. So that's actually really quite a surprise because we originally designed it as a, a way to, to provision compute resources, but people are starting thinking, thinking about, you know, in, in, the, in the sort of more generic sense, so now we're starting to see um, being able to provision VPC, subnets, gateways, and whatnot. So we expect that hopefully, you know, this trend continues that we'll start to see really interesting uh, integrations and plugins that's available. And a big part of it is just also to improve usability because um, um, it's a very young project. Um, there's a lot of things that's sort of a lot of moving parts. Uh, developing it really uh, hasn't been an easy experience. But um, and especially if, you, if you're familiar with any kind of system management, um, configuration is really hard. Just, you know, scripts, different kinds of formats uh, for the different backends that you have to do. So we actually started building out um, the ability to support templating. Um, and, and, and really introduce that as a core way to help us, um, help the user manage um, system configuration. And we'll also now introduce a notion of playbooks. Uh, playbooks are, in a way, uh, uh, the, the InfraKit CLI is actually now dynamic. So it's completely data-driven. So you can define your own uh, verbs. You can define your own flags and all in a configuration file that you can share in a GitHub or some HTTP resource and that your user can actually pull them down as playbook and that actually change the UI and the CLI itself. So that gives a great way for users to kind of take InfraKit as a way to kind of as a starting point and then white label it um, and, and to make it into the, the tool that, that makes sense for them. And obviously, playbook as a concept um, is, is shareable. So um, definitely do stop by later on, and um, I'll, I'll get into this in more detail. And also, of course, improving the core system. So um, since, since we first launched, uh, we now support uh, high availability running in swarm mode or using SCD as backend. Uh, we have different plugin types, uh, metadata and events. So metadata, think of it as a cluster-wide sysfs. Um, that allows you to that allows an operator to actually go in and reflect on the actual environment. So you can do a infrakit uh, metadata ls and see everything you know about maybe about your VPC, your subnet, your instances, all the way down to your swarm joint tokens if uh, you have the plugins running. And finally, uh, you can see events. Events are coming out as. Uh, for example, instances come and go. As they're being discovered, uh, you can actually subscribe. So there's a kind of a publish subscribe um, way for you to really like do um, from your command line to just simply tail a, a, a file path and you can start seeing the, the event streams coming through. Um, and finally, we, we implemented remote access. So that makes it easy so for users who want to do that. Um, you can now actually remotely connect it to an infrared cluster and actually see the events, look at the metadata, look at the, um, you know, the, op the general operations of the system. So in terms of the roadmap, um, I think these are the, from talking to a number of um, people, um, a lot of our users and partners and contributors, I think these are the use cases that we're really finally settling on. Uh, three major use cases. First and foremost, support container orchestration. We want to be able to support bootstrapping and, and date and management of any container orchestrator. So, um, and we also want to be able to provide an API for cluster auto scaling so that um, for all this type of container orchestration system, they have the ability to actually do cluster auto scaling, not just with public cloud, but actually extend it to bare metal hardware um, to different kinds of platforms. And we want to be able to do this to support both Docker, Swarmo, as well as Kubernetes. And then finally, some of the things that are you know, more interesting also is, is along the lines of better bare metal and GPU integration. So looking at things like how to do actually uh, GPU provisioning. And finally, um, IoT applications. Uh, and this is actually a, a, something that uh, would be of interest to you who are you know, 
in the context of Linux Kit that's just been recently announced. So it's really kind of looking at how we can best integrate uh, InfraKit from infrastructure management to uh, with Linux Kit, which actually allows you the ability to define um, your, what your kernel should look like. So we think it's going to be a really, really interesting, um, very you know, fertile area to explore. So, and also, like, really a top thing for us is to improve usability. We really need to finalize the API and schema. A lot of people complain about things are moving, changing around. You know, they go on vacation for two weeks and they come back, try to build their plugin, and things don't work. Uh, we're really working hard to really finalize things and get things stabilized. And so we hit 1.0, and then after that, um, hopefully we'll be in a better place. And the big thing is, is really, you know, to make it easy for people to actually consume it, both as a user and as a developer. So that means, you know, simplifying the setup, making things, you know, possible to embed if you want, um, to actually have sensible CLI so that you don't get bewildered by too many CLI options or have a lot of um, things that just doesn't make a lot of sense. And we want to make it easy for, for people to extend and contribute. So already we kind of identified different areas where people, we can hope, we hope that the community will be able to contribute. And that will be around the areas of metadata, instance plugins. Um, and also, if you don't want to write code, if you just want to edit some text files and push to GitHub, you can help, you know, do build playbooks and reusable templates for managing different kinds of systems or effectively recipes. And, and finally, how do, how do we actually let people know what's out there? Well, it's probably provide better documentation. And uh, so th those are all the things that uh, we're, we're, we're very, you know, we're thinking a lot about and we can definitely use a lot of help. Uh, and finally, also like area, in terms of areas like improving a core system, um, we want to get into sort of provisioning uh, you know, diverse resource types from networks to proxies, load balancers to GPUs. And, and we all want to focus on this, the stability and performance of the core controller. So we want to be able to do rolling updates of, of thousands of nodes across um, multiple zones. Um, so that sort of things and be able to batch things and have a lot of doing things, handle things in, in an asynchronous way. Uh, so those are kind of things that, that will take a little bit of, uh, quite a bit of engineering work that, that will go into the core controller. So that's where we expect to spend a lot of time uh, working on. And also, finally, to help better um, define how to do the proper monitoring and um, health check and um, API. Because a lot of times, you know, from a monitoring perspective and health checks, it's, it's really quite application dependent. So it's, it's, we're, no, we're kind of way past the days of where we're just seeing that, okay, making sure that, making sure that the, the server's up and running. I mean, we now have to think about whether or not it's actually joined successfully as a Kubler or as a, as a Swarm node. So there are different layers of monitoring that, that we, we need to start thinking about as a community. So we want to come up with a common way to do that. And so that's, that's also one of the things that we want to focus on. And then, on, again, back to having making it more useful across more platforms. Um, I think the, the liver integration in KVM um, will be quite nice. And definitely a lot of focus will be on bare metal, um, hardware ops integration. So think, looking at things like Redfish, IPMI, um, those, are, those are kind of things that's starting to show up on our radar and that we want to start focusing on. Um, and finally, and most important part is, is, is have a strong integration with Linux Kit because at the end of the day, um, we want to be able to build, test, and deploy clusters um, really from one, one common environment where we can define everything from, about our infrastructure all the way from, you know, all the way from the top of, in terms of what resources, all the way down to what the kernels need to look like in, in a single environment, single pipeline. So that's kind of the direction that I think we, you know, having spoken with the team, with the Linux Kit team, um, we, we feel like this is, this is where a lot of the, uh, you know, synergy and co cooperation can happen between these projects. So, um, we need help. Uh, <laughs> it's, there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, there's a lot of stuff, um, but I think it's, it's quite an exciting project. Um, it's, it, you know, it, I think in, in the area of bare metal integration, um, really we we're starting to kind of you know, teach old dogs new tricks. You know, all of a sudden people can see that I can have auto scaling groups, um, I can have spot instance fleets. Um, off the cloud. I mean, I can have it in my own on-prem environment. 
Uh, I think that's ex extremely exciting, uh, being able to do something, you know, exotic hardware and um, resource provisioning. And I think that's, that's really a, the area that we, will, we really need a lot of your input and help. Uh, so please come check it out. Um, you know, GitHub, Docker slash Infricate. We may move soon, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but definitely keep in touch over at uh, Docker community. Um, uh, the channel is, is, is called Infricate. Thank you. Yes. Just wanted to say I'm happy to help with the Kubernetes stuff. Yes. Um, oh, he's happy to help with Kubernetes stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my response is yes, please. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, yes. So do I see any challenges uh, porting this project or working To the, to the various architecture, and I think you know a lot of it is is. I think a lot of it will depend on community involvement, and, and we definitely want to see um, contributions that that could help us along those lines. Um, right now, if you look at Infricate, it's a it's a it's a fairly um, it's a fairly open API, and it's a fairly generic. It provides a certain level of abstractions in terms of how you view how we view resources. What are the basic requirements of of provisioning resources? Um, and then from that point on, we're doing the sort of, you know, the, or, the infrastructure orchestration. Um, not unlike, you know, CloudFormation or Terraform, we, we, we're starting to look at doing dependency analysis. Um, we're, you know, we, we, we think about, you know, rolling updates. So um, it really, I think, for those different architectures, it's going to be more around, like, well, how we can actually get the, the, the particular drivers to support those. So I hope that answered your question. Anything else? All right, cool, thanks. So who's next? Okay. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes to explain exactly what uh, Infinity is up to. So first, the objective uh, for Infinity is really to build uh, a full feature storage platform. So we presented two days ago, the key value store, which I will talk about in a little bit. But really, uh, this is just the first step, and the goal is to build something much bigger, which has the specificity of being decentralized, which is something uh, not common, and also policy-based. And it will basically look like that. Uh, at the top, you can see the key value store, where you have all the distribution mechanism with handling the blocks, and you have a few policies regarding data placements, redundancy, and so on. On top of which, you can create different storage logics from a file system uh, that could be POSIX compliant or not. And in every logic, you can also create or define, activate uh, policies. For instance, for the file system, you could decide to activate versioning. But you can create other ones, such as an object storage, like F3, or a block device and so on and so forth. And for every storage logic, you will be able to really customize it to the needs of your application through those sets of policies. And as you can see, on top of those, you've got different uh, interfaces. So an object storage could be accessed through uh, F3, but it could be accessed through uh, another uh, API uh, if you want. And also, we will provide direct access through specific APIs, both at the key value store, which is what we presented two days ago, but also for every storage logic. So you could imagine uh, programming your file system without mounting it, which can be interesting if your application actually needs access control, uh, an IR call organization, stuff like that, but you do not want to mount it. So that's the goal, but that's not what we have today. So what we've decided to do uh, is really focus on the key layer, which is the key value store, which is all about distributing data, uh, so redundancy, uh, consistency, uh, fault tolerance, rebalancing, and so on and so forth, which is really the, the most difficult part. In particular because, again, we do it in a decentralized way, which adds a little bit of fun. So that, that's the focus. Um, so the roadmap, uh, kind of, because it remains to be validated by Solomon, 
who just left the room, which is good, because <laughs> I can't say anything. And uh, the goal for Q2 is really to, to focus on the scalability and resilience aspects. Uh, uh, we haven't spent enough time uh, stabilizing the whole thing, so that's, that's the goal for Q2. Also, uh, as we announced during DockerCon, we plan on open sourcing the key value store in the coming month. For Q3, the goal will really be to start working on performance, uh, because again, that's obviously something important if you intend to use it. Uh, but we will also start integrating with the other Docker products that actually need uh, persistent storage. So I've listed two here. Uh, that could be the cluster-wide image distribution, which may not be clear for uh, all of you, but is probably clear to uh, Docker employees. Uh, and the registry as well, which could uh, actually use a storage backend, uh, which is reliable. And finally, in Q4, we will actually start uh, building the platform that I basically showed earlier with more storage logics, more policies, basically extending the possibilities of infinite. So now, uh, there are several projects that form that stack. Uh, some are open source, some not yet. So I'd like to go through them so that you have a glimpse of what we've built and what we intend to open source uh, for everyone here to contribute if you want. So the first one is not the most important one, but it's just a build system that we've, built, we've developed. Uh, it's in Python. It is open source, accessible on uh, GitHub at infinite slash Drake, so it's not on Docker's uh, organization, and maybe that will change in the future. Again, things may be moved. Then we have a, a library uh, in C++ that is really the base of everything that we've built at Infinite. That's something which is really important to us. Uh, so C++ is synchronous based on coroutines. Um, <clears throat> that helps us to develop uh, software very quickly. So we think that it's a really interesting piece of technology for the C++ community. Uh, so if you are using C++, check it out. Then there is a key value store that doesn't have a name yet uh, and uh, will be open source in the coming month. So then we will be able to announce uh, where it is. Um, so as, as we, we, we said uh, two days ago, if you are interested by the way we do uh, uh, design and develop this key value store, uh, feel free to reach out to us by email or just talk to us and, and, and we'll try to give you early access to it. And if you want to contribute, obviously, again, uh, you're welcome. And finally, uh, the infinite storage platform, which is close to us for now. Um, there is not much uh, in any case because we are focusing on the key value store. Now, if you go to Infinite's website, which is infinite.sh, you will find a file system on top of this key value store that you can actually deploy. So you can do that, but do not expect to put that in production yet, and we are not really uh, spending time on it, so that's really not what you should use today. Um, in the future, however, we intend to open source at least part of it, but the question is going to be, what do we want to keep for enterprises? What do we want to open source? So I can't say much more for now, um, but definitely uh, it will be uh, usable uh, and probably parts will be open sourced. So that's basically it. Um, if I summarize, the, really the focus for the coming month is going to be on the key value store so that any developer can benefit from a basic construct to store and share data within a distributed system. Um, and on top of that, we'll extend. That's the basic idea. Do you have any questions? Either it's very clear or not at all. Yep. <clears throat> so that should take approximately 23 minutes because it's exactly the talk I gave, but basically um, in a distributed system that uses the manager worker model, you, depending on the use case, because it's not for all the application, but for some application that has uh, 
that are really intensive in terms of data flow. The managers may be overflowed, so you may have problems in terms of performance, uh, resilience, uh, scalability as well, because the managers cannot be scaled as easily as the workers. It's kind of the point of this model. In a decentralized architecture, the requests are going to be distributed naturally between all the nodes. So all the nodes are playing both parts of managers and workers. So there is kind of collective algorithm to do everything. So it's going to be faster because we distribute naturally the load. And it is going to be more resilient because if you have a failure, it's not going to impact the whole system. You can't have cascading effects of masters uh, failing one after another. Uh, it is going to be more scalable because you don't have those managers, so you can actually scale very easily, and so on and so forth. So there are actually a lot of benefits. The drawback is that it's actually very, very difficult to do, but uh, we think that we've done it. Yes. So we have, uh, oh, good point. So nobody asked for repeating the previous question, so I guess nobody cared for this one. Uh, so will there be uh, policies uh, based on consistency? So I don't know if there may be, maybe Quentin will be able to, to, to tell you more, but I don't know if there will be a, policies based on consistency, but there, there is, there are already policies for the consistency model, where you can decide if you want to use that algorithm or another one, and in the future we'll, you will be able to say, I want strong consistency or eventual consistency, because that's what I want. So what do I think of CSI, the container, container Storage Interface, which, is, uh, which has been drafted, uh, and the document has been drafted by uh, several uh, people from different companies. Uh, I can tell you my opinion. Uh, so I, we haven't looked at it precisely uh, in detail now, uh, but uh, we will do that very soon. What I think is, I think it's, it, it's a good thing for the community because, I mean, vendors will have to write only one plugin for all the systems. I think it's good also for Docker because as a platform, vendors will be more easily present on Docker's platform. So I think that overall it's good. It's a good idea. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically my, my two cents. Yes? So, like, so <clears throat> uh, if I repeat the question, uh, or I try, uh, is uh, in terms of policies, do I mean in the sense of tiering? Was that the question? Okay. Uh, so it depends of what you mean by tiering, because many people mean different things. For some people, it's basically an isolation concept. For others, in the concept of storage, is the ability to move your data to a different storage tier, which could be your, big, your, store, your data is hot, it is stored on a hot level uh, storage device, uh, like SSD or flash array or whatever, and f at some point, the data becomes less important, so you want to automatically move it to another tier. Uh, that's something completely different. So that's not something we do, the second one. The first one, uh, we have uh, tiering in the sense that when you create uh, a storage logic, uh, it is going to be specific to your application. So you're not going to be um, in conflict with other storage logics used by other applications. So in that sense, there is tiering. All good? Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna talk to you about uh, Unikernels and Mirage OS, uh, which is what the, um, 
this little bit uh, was listed on the internal summit markdown as, but it's like a lot of things at the internal summit secretly about something else. Um, also, uh, I'm Mindy, uh, for people who don't know me already. Um, so first I'll give a really quick update on Mirage OS, uh, which we talked about at the Distributed Systems Summit uh, in Berlin um, back in October. Um, since then, we've released version 3.0 of Mirage OS uh, in February. Um, the TLDR is, it now supports KVM via the Solo 5 project, um, in addition to Zen, which was previously supported as a hypervisor to run your unikernels on. Um, it also has, we fixed a whole bunch of broken stuff. Um, so if you tried to use Mirage OS before or write applications for it and you were like, this is broken, um, have another look, see whether you still think so. Um, there is a link to the full release notes there which have a lot more information on stuff that we wrote, stuff that we fixed, things you might be interested in. Um, also, I should mention, um, if you're interested in uh, other targets that you might want to run Mirage OS unikernels on, that Solo 5 is still improving um, and it will shortly be able to target even more things. Uh, Beehive is actually fairly well supported at the moment um, in FreeBSD and uh, coming soon will be hypervisor.framework. So you'll be able to more easily run your unikernels uh, on your Mac, which they seem to be fairly popular looking out around the room. So others may be interested in that. But really what I would want to talk to you about is something that we're doing now because a release that we did in February is like super old news. Nobody cares anymore. Everybody knows about that already. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, something we've been calling Mirage SDK for Linux Kit. Um, so Linux Kit lets you assemble some particular set of components in order to make a platform, which is really great. So you have some set of components and you know what they are. And you've done some, you, you've done some investigation into, your, into their properties. You know what sort of things they need, what kind of permissions, what they should be doing. Um, once you have this set of known components, uh, there's sort of a natural next question, which is, could you be using better components to get the same things done? So what we want to do with Mirage SDK is let you use better components, uh, either make them for you, or help you make your own better components, um, which you might use uh, in Linux Kit. So our goal is to let operators choose and invent more secure and more specialized implementations of the things that they've discovered that they can't do without. So um, some more specific things about what that means, and this is taken directly from the Mirage SDK readme. Um, the kind of components that we're talking about are things that can run in a container as a single static binary. Um, they follow a common configuration convention based on bind mounts from the host. Um, they're not intended to be portable to other Linux or operating systems distributions. Um, we're uh, making decisions about how these components should communicate um, with, the, with, uh, with the larger set of uh, things that are going on within the, uh, within the OS um, that will probably not be portable. Um, we will encourage people to uh, allow for whatever components they write to be portable in other places if they want them to be. But the idea is more, um, we'll allow you to use the minimal things that you would like to use in this environment. And ideally, the amount of uh, stuff that you have to do for that integration should be very small. So, Sorry, I'm fussing with the, I uh, have to fuss a bit with the uh, text size there to get everything on the slide. Hopefully it's still a bit legible. Um, so what I mean when I say better is also, like usually when we talk about better in the context of components like a DHCP client or something, we mean either it has a feature you need or it won't crash all the time, it's more secure, it won't do anything you don't want it to do. Um, so I just wanted to enumerate um, also the, thing, like, things, the things that are good properties that we'll be looking for. So um, and when we run things uh, in this context, what we want are things like, um, we, have, we have a minimal set of capabilities, which are the things we actually need. Um, after we read our configuration, we, draw, we uh, privilege separate and drop everything that we can possibly drop. Um, the next bullet point is, sort of, is a little bit more, um, more blue sky. Um, I mentioned uh, that we got support for uh, KVM um, in Mirage OS. And so if we're running on, if we're in a bare metal environment, it might be possible for us to, um, for us to architect these, uh, these components in such a way that if it's available to us, we can actually run them with KVM isolation rather than container isolation. Um, and if that's not available, we should use the best tools that are available to us to restrict the possible things that, uh, that this component can do. We'd also really like to make strong statements like all untrusted network traffic has to be handled in memory safe languages, um, which is a very opinionated thing to say, uh, but if you don't agree, you don't have to use it. So um, I personally think it's a great idea and I'm very excited about it. 
Um, and we'd also like to enable people who are building these components to, um, to, discover, to discover problems with them like before they hit production. Because the reason that you assemble these things is that you want to use them. And if you are assembling something with Linux Kit, you want to use it in a lot of places. Um, and you really don't want to be the person who discovers that there's a problem with one of these components via a public CV release. You'd like to be using components that are tested to get the really uh, low-hanging fruit stuff out of the way first so that you can, if you're writing such a component, you can discover this problem before it even makes it off your hard drive, before you even commit that code. Um, so we want to make nice tools for you to be able to, to discover those things when you're writing these components. So um, the SDK that, we are, uh, that we're trying to put together will initially, this, this isn't a big surprise after you heard uh, Justin's uh, nice championing of, of these languages. Um, it, will it will initially support OCaml um, via Mirage OS um, because there are a lot of nice libraries that we want to use that are already in Mirage OS um, that have nice cut points so that we can drop them down on top of the uh, so that we can drop them down on top of the interface that I described previously. Um, we would also like to target Rust, um, and later we uh, we're looking at we'll be looking at other languages later. Um, it says never on this slide, which is a pretty strong statement for me to make at my pay grade, but uh, it's, in the, it's, uh, it's straight, from the, uh, straight from the readme, so um, if, you, uh, if you disagree, PR is welcome. Uh, uh, never see without sandboxing. So what we currently have is really, really embryonic. Uh, we have, we're working on proofs of concept for the sorts of components that we would write um, so that we can figure out, like, Okay, what are what are the things that we that, that are common between these components when we've actually assembled them and written them? Um, what are the what are the things that makes it that make it useful to be able to write and test these things? Um, the first thing that we're doing is a DHCP client. Um, you might have noticed that that was one of the few things in um, Rolf's demo um, of Linux Kit that was included in the minimal uh, minimal Linux that was built because you often need one. Um, and the next things that we're going to do as proofs of concept are NTPD and probably HTTPS. Um, to get a bit more into why DHCP, uh, it's not just because I think it's really cool. Um, it's, you often need it. Um, it, needs, it needs to be able to do a lot of things. It needs to be able to tell your kernel, like, uh, it needs to be able to set routes. It needs to be able to configure networking. Um, and those, those things are inherent to what DHCP needs to do. Like, it's, it's very, you can't, you can't just say, okay, you can, you don't get to do that anymore. It's, sorry. Um, but DHCP is also really complicated because of, uh, because of the way that it works. It often uh, implements its own parsers. It needs to interface with sockets in a different way than most code usually interfaces with sockets. And so it's really easy to get wrong. And it usually, usually DHCP clients have a lot of code paths that aren't frequently tested in a lot of environments. So it's at this really unfortunate intersection of something that's important and it's often trusted and it's also pretty complicated. So we thought it would be a nice thing to replace. Um, this is uh, the, oh wow, that really doesn't show up very well at all, sorry. Um, you, can look at the, uh, you can look at the roadmap for Mirage SDK um, to get a better view of this. Yeah. Um, this is the architecture so far for uh, the sorts of things that we would be running um, with these containers. So we have, um, we have on the right a uh, CAF, which is sort of the uh, program logic. In the case of our DHCP client, that's the thing that uh, knows how to say, okay, send a packet, receive a packet, figure out what the next packet to send is, figure out whether I have a lease. And then we have um, a privilege process, which uh, sits as an intermediary between the CAF and uh, the rest of the system. And also, once the CAF has finished figuring out uh, the information that it needs, the, uh, the privilege side will do the actual uh, syscalls to, set, to actually do that setup. The idea is that we have a really, uh, we have a small and narrow data, data path between these two things. So even if we mess up the, uh, even if we mess up the logic for the CAF, um, we, it's really, di it's difficult for us to express things that we shouldn't be able to express and then pass that expression onto the privileged container, which then passes it on into the, the wider system. Um, if I have time, I was gonna give you a quick demo. All right. So um, if you want to have a look at this yourself, uh, you can clone github.com slash linuxkit slash linuxkit and have a look in projects uh, slash Mirage SDK. Um, I'm going to build this uh, example, which is the Mirage DHCP client really quick. So 
I'll pump that up a little bit. Oh, too much, too much. Maybe not. Uh, I've been Moby build, sorry. We're just building an OS, no big deal. It's fine. All right, there we go. And uh, I'm gonna run this via the uh, QEMU, um, if I can type. Uh, so that'll launch, um, that'll launch here. I don't have KVM on this laptop because it's running Zen. Um, so I've, so I've, launched, uh, I've launched the Linux that I built there. Um, it takes quite a long time to boot because it's uh, running in QEMU in a VM and starting a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but here my, um, here my DHCP client uh, was started. You can see that right there. Uh, it's running via ContainerD. See in containers, services. Here's the DHCP client. So um, here's all the configuration for that. The interesting bit, well, there are several interesting bits, but uh, so here's the, um, here's where we see the, um, where the data from the DHCP client is going to live. We can go have a look at that. And we can switch over to the, uh, this is expressed as a Git repository. We can switch over to CAF, which is where the information is hanging out. Oops, sorry, check out. And we can see the um, log of all of the changes that the, uh, that the container made to um, basically to drop information in so that the uh, privilege side would update this information. So once the lease transaction is concluded, it gets a gateway, it gets an IP, it drops that information in. Um, the privilege container says, okay, here's, here's the MAC address that you should use in these packets. Uh, I got that from the system at large. So um, I could show you some logs. Uh, if you've ever seen a DHCP transaction, they won't be super interesting to you. Um, so maybe I'll skip that. Um, our goals, again, are to make it easy for developers to write new services and make it easy for operators to introspect on running services and their interactions. Um, so this might, uh, this idea of like having really small constraints specified services probably sounds familiar. As I said, there's a reason we wanted to start with OCaml. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully the shims that we write will be small, they'll build on top of the libraries we already have and we can benefit hopefully from the community that's been built around that project and that's interested in that project. We also have a lot of people who've expressed that they're interested in this project, but just like have no way to begin because it's such a strange alien thing to like try to take your entire gigantic application, um, which is sort of, you can think of as a, maybe a collection of microservices that you might implement as a bunch of different containers and try to pair all of that down to this tiny little thing. And I think that these little components are maybe better fits for where we are with unikernels right now. Um, so uh, that's about it for what I had prepared. Um, if you have questions, we can, uh, I can answer a few right now, probably, or, um, or we can talk more later. Uh, I'll be here for both of the tracks and loads of other people will be too, so thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question was the, uh, the communication between the CAF and the privileged, uh, privileged process is that using Git, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the communication is like the, uh, the protocol, it's actually done over um, Cap'n Proto at the moment, and then it's sort of reflected into something that, that can write Git stuff um, through its, uh, the answer is yes and, basically. <laughs> Uh, was that at all illuminative? Sorry. All right. Cool. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>